faithful God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, unshakable. You are our redeemer. And we praise you. Amen. So this morning we are going to deal with the topic of baptism. This is the time in the Christian liturgical year that, uh, that we observe the baptism of the Lord. Advent begins the new Christian year, the preparation for the coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. We, we remember his birth, that he was born as a baby, that he grew up to be a man. And Jesus' public ministry begins with his baptism. It's recorded in all four Gospels. It's, it's the beginning of his public phase of his ministry. Baptism is also the beginning of our entrance into our life in the family of God. It's the sacrament that we, that we observe as the, uh, as the entrance, uh, as the starting point, if you will. And so today we're going to talk about baptism. Jesus' baptism and our own baptism. Now some of you may, uh, as, we, as we think about Jesus' baptism, may ask this question. You may, have, you may have pondered this. Was it really necessary for Jesus, of all people, to be baptized? Any of you ever thought of that? Maybe, maybe not. Well, today we're going to consider it. Was it really necessary for Jesus, of all people, to be baptized? If baptism is our entrance into the family of God, to signify that we are God's children. Wasn't Jesus already God's son? Wasn't Jesus always God's son? If baptism is a sign of one being washed in water, cleansed, forgiven for repentance of sins, wasn't Jesus without sin? Didn't Jesus live a perfect life? Why would he need baptism? If baptism is a sacrament, if it, it, if it is a tangible sign of, a, of an invisible grace that symbolizes a change, a transformation, the word baptism itself, using or hearkening to that idea of uh, the act of dipping cloth into dye, and removing the cloth from that solution changed and different. If we're thinking of baptism in, in that basic root of the word, that baptism changes us like it changes the cloth as it is dipped into dye and removed. Wasn't Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever? Why did Jesus need transformation or change? Was it really necessary for Jesus, of all people, to be baptized? Jesus was already God's son. Jesus was without sin. Jesus himself was righteousness and in right relationship with the Father. So what is going on here in Jesus' baptism? Jesus tells John, who balks at the idea that Jesus would, would come seeking baptism from him, Jesus says to John the Baptist, it's fitting, it's right, it is the obedient thing for us to do. It is fitting for all righteousness that we obey the Father's will to perform all righteousness in this act. In Psalm 53, which is a beautiful psalm from the Old Testament, or, or excuse me, from Isaiah 53, we read from Isaiah 42 this morning that talks about this beautiful picture of who the Messiah would be who comes with God's blessing to make all things new, to give sight to the blind, to release captives, to do a new thing. But Isaiah 53 also talks about this Messiah as the suffering servant who was bruised for our iniquity, who upon, 
uh, that one was laid all of our sin and by whose stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 talks of the Messiah in this way. In the 11th verse of that chapter, it says, By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted as righteousness. So Jesus says to John the Baptist, It is fitting that we do this to fulfill all righteousness. Because the coming of the Messiah, the chosen one, was by his righteousness to make us the righteousness of God by his act. So there is, in a sense, some foreshadowing here that why Jesus has come and what Jesus will do as the Messiah. Also in Isaiah 54, or excuse me, Isaiah 64, uh, there's that portion of scripture that speaks about our righteousness being as filthy rags before a righteous God. In Colossians 3, we, uh, we also know that in Jesus Christ, and only because of Jesus Christ, are we seen as right? Are we seen as worthy in the eyes of God? Because us standing before a righteous God we are clothed in filthy rags <clears throat> covered by our sin. But Colossians says that we have been clothed in Christ. We have put on Christ. And that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And so Jesus in his baptism is fulfilling all righteousness. And becoming the righteousness of many. That's us. I love the hymn that uh, we have sung many times here at, at Grace. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And there's a verse in that hymn that goes like this. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless, to stand before the throne. Dressed in Christ's righteousness, we stand before the throne. It is on Christ the solid rock that we stand. On his righteousness and all other ground is sinking sand. This baptism is about the grace that we see in the life of Jesus Christ. His grace, His righteousness. And so as Jesus was baptized, He came to John to be baptized, what Jesus is showing us is that in His righteousness, He is obedient to His Father. He is doing what the Father has asked Him to do. And He has come to be our righteousness. And He has come in His righteousness to make us right with the Father. As we become the righteousness of Christ, we are put back in right relationship with the Father by what Jesus has done for us. In the verses that we read this morning, John the Baptist is the forerunner. He is preparing the way of the Lord. And he is uh, he's dressed in rather anachronistic garb. He's got on camel hair. He's got a diet of the Old Testament prophets. It's hearkening back to an old time. But, but, but John, as he is prophesying in the wilderness, he's, he's causing quite a stir. He's attracting attention. People are coming out. They are drawn to his message of anticipation and preparation of Messiah who was coming. And when John looks at those who were coming to hear his preaching and to receive baptism... He notices that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming. And it says they're coming for baptism. And John has a rather strong reaction to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and the reason they are coming, the orientation that they bring, the mindset that they have, it, it is exposed by what we heard John say in the text this morning. John says, you brood of vipers. 
Who warned you of the wrath to come? What are you doing out here seeking to be baptized yourselves? Saying that you have Abraham as your father. You've got the pedigree. You say you've got, you've got the title. You've got the position. You've got the family name. But that's not is what is going to make you righteous. Is what John is telling them. They're coming thinking that they are righteous within themselves. That they have the proper pedigree. But John says, I am baptizing you with water. But there is one who is coming who will baptize you with something much more powerful. You may think you're coming out for appearance, to have your sins washed away. So that you can think of yourselves even more highly than you already do. But there is one who will baptize you with the presence of God himself and with fire. And will burn out of your life what is impure and refine you like gold. John is, is, is calling to them to say, do you really know what this is all about? Are your eyes open? Is your heart sensitive? Because your family name will not do it. My baptism will not do it. It is only by the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God at work in your life and by His grace that you will be transformed, that you will be made whole, that you will be a child of God. Jesus comes then to John saying, this is right for us to do because I have come to obey my Father and to fulfill all righteousness. And so Jesus here as he comes to John is modeling for us a surrendered life He's saying, I'm doing what my Father asked me to do. I am doing the will of my Father. And I and the Father are one. Jesus is described in the, the beautiful uh, verses from Philippians 2. And who he is as the servant, the Father. It's called the servant song. It's believed that, that uh, these verses from Philippians 2, 5 through 11, were actually a creed, the earliest creed of the church. That believers, that followers of the risen Lord would say together, have this mind among yourselves that was in Christ Jesus, who though Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something that he could grasp or obtain. No, Jesus emptied himself, surrendered himself, and became a servant, obedient, even unto death, and death on a cross. This is the model of Jesus' life, and this is the, the, the surrender and, and the... Um, humility of Jesus that we see here as he comes seeking baptism from John who said I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals but you are asking me to baptize you but John relents and he baptizes Jesus so this is what we see in the baptism of Jesus he is modeling something for us he is accomplishing something for us and so asking, was it necessary that Jesus be baptized, may be like unto asking a similar question. It's like asking, was it necessary for Jesus to die? And Jesus asked his father the same question. Father, do I have to go through with this? In the Garden of Gethsemane, with the cross before him, Jesus, at the end of his earthly ministry, said to the Father, I have done everything that you have asked me to do. Do I have to do this? 
Can't we let this cup pass from me? Isn't there another way that we can accomplish this bringing righteousness, forgiveness, and transformation, and right relationship? Isn't there another way? Can't we go around the cross and you let this cup of suffering pass from you? But we know that as Jesus was in conversation with his father in the garden, he ends the conversation, but father, not what I want, what you want. Surrendered to God's will, surrendered to the request of his father, he was obedient. And he became our righteousness. And he has put us in right relationship with the Father. As Jesus went un under the water at his baptism, Jesus also went to the cross to die. To die to himself. And in the same way, baptism is this for us. When we come to baptism... It is obedience out of obedience, and it is out of surrender. Not my will, but your will be done in my life. It's a response to the, to the gift of God's grace. It is an act of obedience. And it is what we as the church are called to do. is to bring others to baptism, isn't it? You think of the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel. We read from the third chapter in Matthew's Gospel. But if you go to the end of this Gospel, the resurrected and ascending Lord says to his disciples, his final marching orders are what? Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. This is not Jesus' suggestion. It's not his good idea. It is his order. It is his charge. And after saying that we are to baptize and to teach... Then Jesus reaffirms and reassures by saying what? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so by the same token, if we think of our baptism, it is an act of obedience. And yes, we baptize babies. They don't have a say in whether their parents bring them. But it is out of obedience that parents do bring their children under their care. To receive this gift of grace. And the parents, as they bring a child for baptism, are asked, Will you raise this child to know and to love and to serve Jesus Christ? That is the charge. Until that time when the child is of their own uh, cognizance and will to say, I receive Jesus Christ. As his grace has been made known to me since before I knew who God was. Before I knew what Jesus has done for me. And so in this way it's an act of surrender as well and obedience that parents bring children. For the children to go under the water. Uh, and and, and the, the, the adult or the young person who may come for baptism. Uh, is in a sense also dying to self, surrendering will to come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says something powerful about baptism in his letter to the church at Rome. Sometimes at funerals this uh, scripture is read. Paul writes, when we are baptized in Christ Jesus, we are baptized into his death. 
We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So baptism, the going under the water, even if it is a small amount of water, it is our submitting to the water and dying to ourselves, surrendering to the will of God that we might be raised to a new life in him. The denomination of which we're a part, the Evangelical Covenant Order, talks about new life. I believe it, that, that this denomination is a new thing that God is doing in this day and in this time. And it's an it's exciting challenge. It's an exciting journey to follow where God leads to do what this denomination claims it has been called to do, and that is to build flourishing churches that do what? Make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that is the mission of our denomination. It is the mission of Grace Presbyterian Church that, that we build a flourishing church that doesn't just baptize babies, but that makes disciples of Jesus Christ at whatever stage of life they may be. Our growth and our flourishing would go at a pretty uh, slow rate if we just wait for you to start having more babies. Amen? Anybody out there lining up? We've got Lacey who's pregnant. So our call is not to wait for more babies to be born, to baptize more babies, but to make disciples of Jesus Christ at wherever those people find themselves on their journey of life. As young adults, as middle-aged, or older, and nearer the time when they would go and see the Lord face to face and join the balcony of heaven. It's exciting to me to think about being faithful to this call to build a flourishing church that makes disciples of Jesus Christ and that we would see baptisms abound. That we would be baptizing more and more people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and to say that the God who created you is the God who loves you so much He would give you His Son and He is with you and will never leave you. And has great plan and purpose for your life. Let's discover what that is. I wonder what it would be like if we as Grace Presbyterian Church would adopt as a goal that we would see more baptisms of adults. Is there anybody in here this morning who has not been baptized? So we got the club right here. <laughs> and if we're going to follow the mandate of Jesus who said, Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Folks, we're going to have to go somewhere to find those people, aren't we? And what an exciting mission to be on. To follow the living God out into the world to say we are looking for people to bring them into this family. That they might know the joy of serving a crucified and risen Savior. We would love to see us have that as a goal. Because there are people out there who need the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking of a story, and I know that we're going beyond the time. We started at 10 after, and we had some other things going on. But I, this is important for us to hear this morning. There's a friend of mine who is uh, actually a, a graduate of Davidson College, and he is now a pastor. But I heard him tell this story once at a workshop for pastors about uh, bringing young adults into the life of the church. 
this pastor, when he uh, had finished college, he decided that he was going to go to Japan and teach English. And he had not been churched in his life. He said the last time he had been to church was about eighth grade. And his idea of the church in his young adulthood was that it was a place like United Way that just kind of helped people. But when he was there in Japan, he, he, he made friends who were also teaching English. And one of them invited him to a worship service in which he was going to be baptized. And so he went to this little house that was run as a mission house by two Norwegian missionaries. And he said he experienced an incredible worship service. And then there came a time in the worship service when they took up the tatami mats from the center of the room in which they were meeting. And underneath was a pool, a baptismal pool. And he said that his friend then went down into the baptismal pool and she was baptized. And they took her under the water. And he said, and as she was raised up out of the water... It was like something was glowing from within inside of her, and her face shone like there was a light upon it. And he said the expression on her face was like nothing I had ever seen before in my life. And he said, I had experienced a lot of things in my life, but I had never experienced anything that had given me that expression. And he said, when I saw that, I determined that I wanted what she had. And he set out on an exploration of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And he's a pastor today. And folks, I believe that other people are looking at us. And they're checking our expression and they're watching our life. And there are those that will see within us, by the grace of God, something that they do not have and will say, how do I get that? And we can say, let me tell you and let me show you. How exciting would that be? That people would be drawn to a relationship with Jesus Christ and come to know him through the flourishing of our church as we seek to make disciples of Jesus Christ, that they would see something of God's grace shining in our own faces, and they would say, I want that. There is a verse from Galatians in chapter 3 that speaks about what baptism does for us in our relationship with our loving God and our relationship with brothers and sisters. And how desperately we need to know the baptized life in this world. And the relationships that it calls us to enjoy as a church following Jesus Christ. And Paul writes in Galatians, But now that faith has come, we are no longer <coughs> under a custodian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are called as members of the family of God. We have a new name. We have a new identity. We have the very spirit of God within us that gives us new life. And as those who are baptized... And called into the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, God says to us, to you and to me, the very thing that God said to his son at his baptism. You are my child. And with you I am very pleased. Let that ring in your ears. And who do you know that needs to hear those same words? My friends... The one who has called us, the one who has claimed us, the one who has died for us, the one who empowers us is the one who will never leave or forsake us. He's promised. See what love the Father has for us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. That's what we are. Let's go tell the Lord. Father God, may the words 
of your Holy Scripture. May the words that you have planted in our hearts today empower us to be your faithful people in this world that seems to be so divided and distracted. Would you please use us to share the good news that we have found in Jesus Christ and by our words and by our example be a witness to him to draw others into relationship with you as we seek to be part of and watch you build the family of God even in our midst. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we do pray. Amen. Yeah.